What's the best thing HR can give an employee? A, believe. B, become. C, belong. D, all of the above. Mm. 79% checked all of the above. Mm -hmm. E, none of the above. <laughs> we had uh, over a thousand people on the webinar. Two percent checked E, none of the above. Mm. My answer is it's E. Mm. What's the best thing HR can give an employee? And my answer is we have the pleasure of welcoming Dave Aldrich today to our interview series. I'm Aishwarya Jain from the People Home team. I have with me Sekar. Sekar is the EVP of Engineering. His prior stints include various product engineering roles in Success Factors SAP, Yahoo and Informatica with 30 years of experience in both enterprise and consumer internet products. Also, just a quick introduction of PeopleHome. PeopleHome is an end-to-end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. We run the PeopleHome blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. Over to Sekar now. Thank you, Ashuria. Um, and now for our guest, uh, Dave Ulrich. Uh, Dave Ulrich is the co-founder and principal of the RBL Group. Dave has written 30 books and over 200 articles. He has shaped the HR profession and been called the father of modern HR and HR thought leader of the decade by focusing on HR outcomes, governance, competencies, and practices. He's ranked as the number one management guru by Business Week profiled by Fast Company as one of the world's top 10 creative people in business, a top five coach in Forbes, and recognized on Thinkers 50 as one of the world's leading business thinkers. We are extremely happy to have someone of his stature on our interview series. Welcome, Shaker, what? Thank you, Shaker. I am so honored to uh, be there. Welcome to my home office. Uh, I think one of the things this uh, new uh, coronavirus does is it it allows us to peek into people's personal lives i uh, get to peek into your home office and you into mine and it allows us to recognize that we don't have to have our hair cut as often as we should uh, i've been uh, at home and sheltering as many others have throughout throughout the world and so i uh, realize i need a great haircut but welcome to my home office thank you dave um so uh, the first question i had for you uh, dave was um you have an amazing range of uh, experience in HR. Um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming one of the most influential HR thought leaders? Uh, would like to hear your stories around. Kind. Um, and again, uh, you start with a very good question. Uh, we all like to talk about ourselves. I'll try to do it very briefly. Um, I have a passion not for uh, HR as much as for learning. Mm -hmm. And I have a passion to learn. And the, the tagline, we did a book on learning a number of years ago, was called Ideas with Impact. And so I love to have ideas and learning and fresh ideas, but I love to have impact. What's the outcome of the idea? An idea without impact is not very helpful. Impact with bad ideas is even less helpful. So I uh, was in school, I was gonna be an attorney. Uh, that's only a step lower than an HR tech person, perhaps. But uh, um, And I took a course in or what was called at the time organizational behavior. Um, and it was a new course. It was obviously decades ago. Uh, the, the professor just captivated my attention. He said, there's nothing assigned, but go look at the organizations where you live, where you work, where you play, where you worship, and figure out how they shape your life. And then write what you learned. Uh, that semester, I ended up writing, I think, 12, 15-page papers. Every week, I'd write a paper. And he called me in and he said, Dave, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go to law school. And he said, don't waste your time. Come study organizational behavior. Um, long story short, I, uh, in fact, a funny story a little bit. I called my mother and my father and I said, I'm going to shift from being an attorney to studying OB. <laughs> and they said, OB is obstetrics. You're going to be a doctor. And I said, no, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to study organizational behavior. And they said, what's that? And I said, I don't know. But it's a marvelous way to think about it. And over the last 30 years since then, my wife has claimed, she's a very good psychologist, I have a version of what's called OCD. OCD in English is obsessive compulsive disorder. 
My disorder is organizational compulsive disorder, OCD, organization compulsive. I love to study organizations. How do they work? How do they operate? How do they affect people? How do they deliver outcomes? So over my lifetime, that's what I've tried to study is organizational problems that don't have simple solutions and to try to figure out the ideas that will have impact. Wow. Very interesting. <laughs> OCD, we learn a new, a new abbreviation today. <laughs> I hope you never get it. I hope you never get it because sometimes I'll be in a restaurant when we're out of sheltering and I'll call over the restaurant manager and I'll say, I can change five things about this restaurant to increase your productivity 10%. And my wife who's with me says, Dave, don't do that. Don't do that. It doesn't make the restaurant experience any better. But that's my passion. I, uh, I, uh, my children have said, people don't want to come to dinner with us if we're dating them because dad's going to talk about the organizations he wants to change. So anyway, that's, uh, that's, where, I, that's where I live. Yeah, interesting. Um, so in your uh, study of all uh, different organizations, I'm sure you have come across um, different types of managers. Um, so uh, what in your opinion, when you look at all the different organizations that you have interacted with, um, constitutes becoming a successful manager? What types of practices do they follow? Great question. Uh, what behaviors? You know, uh, one of the things in my uh, graduate training, mm -hmm. I never asked, Sikor, do you have a, do you have graduate training as well? Yes, yes I did. <laughs> in uh, Iowa. I don't know. <laughs> in I went Iowa. to in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to high school in Kansas City, so I, I know flatland. <laughs> um, uh, I had to do a PhD and write a dissertation as part of the, uh, the ritual. Mm -hmm. My dissertation was in what's called numerical taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Numerical taxonomy is the science of simplicity. How do you use statistics to create taxa to create simplicity? So one of the things I've done throughout my career is taken a complex subject and tried to find a simple solution to make sense of it. Having said that, there have been literally millions and billions. It would be fun to Google leader, you know, and you probably have a billion hits on leader. So what are the key messages in a simple way? About 10 years ago, my colleagues and I tried to do a taxonomy. What are some key skill sets of leaders or managers who tend to be more effective? We discovered five, and they're really simple. Strategist, you've got to set a direction. Leaders know where they're going. Executors, you got to get things done. Talent managers, you got to care for and nurture your people. Human capital developers, you got to build systems that sustain your future people. And in the middle of those four, strategy, execution, talent, human capital, in the middle is personal proficiency. You have to demonstrate character. I still find those five dimensions, strategy, execution, talent, human capital, organization, and personal, kind of the foundational pieces of what effective leaders need to do. Now, they've evolved over 10 years, the specifics, but those fundamental things seem to be the same. Hmm. So do you, uh, out of these five dimensions that you uh, just said, do you see that as a manager progresses along uh, an org, um, the weightage of some of these dimensions change and uh, oh, sure. how, how do managers cope up with that process? You know, there, there, there are often in any organization career stages. So you, you start as a, as a novice, as an apprentice. My colleague, Norm Smallwood, has done a lot of work on this. In stage two, you become a learner or an individual contributor. At stage three, a manager. And at stage four, more of a strategist. Those five dimensions, strategy, execution, um, I hope I can remember them, strategist, executioner, um, talent manager, human capital, and personal, can be looked at at each of those four stages. Uh, as you enter an organization, you're, you're the learner, you're the novice, you're the apprentice, and, and your job in managing strategy is to make it happen. As an individual contributor, your job in strategy is to understand it, to offer contribution. As a as a manager at stage three, your job is to help manage the systems. And then at the fourth stage, the director strategy stage, your job is to establish the strategy. So absolutely, you can match those kinds of grids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, a little bit of a, a topic shift to some of the current um, contemporary topics and uh, times that we are going through right now. 
Um, I'm sure employee retention and talent acquisition uh, will continue to remain a challenge um, through uh, these times and after uh, when we get to a new normal too. Um, what do you think are strategies uh, for organizations to address these challenges, particularly uh, in the context of retention and talent acquisition? And when hopefully we get to a no new normal state, is that going to change? Or what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, talent is the raw ingredients of any organization. Mm -hmm. uh, the professor who I referred to decades ago, who's still a mentor, the line he taught in my head is organizations don't think, people do. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, I've come back at him and I've said, uh, Bonner, Bonner Ritchie, there's a corollary. Organizations don't think, people do. But organizations will shape how people think, behave, and feel. And so you've got to manage both of those. But um, I think in the talent space, which is obviously critical, they're the raw ingredients. If you don't have good uh, talent, you're, it's going to be very difficult to build a great organization. Um, in bringing people in, the process doesn't change. We've got to set standards. What kind of skills do we need now and in the future, both technical and cultural? We have to source people. Where do we find people who might have that set of skills? Uh, are we going to find those part-time, full-time, on contract? Where do we find them? How do we screen them? How do we make sure that we filter those against those set of standards? Uh, and let me go back to standards real quick. I think what we're learning out of this corona pandemic, and, the, and I call it a global timeout, is the standard is not just technical. Do I have the technical training from an Iowa university? <laughs> the standard is also cultural and social. Do I have the capacity to learn, to adapt, to grow? So set standards, source people, screen people, secure the right people, and then orient the right people. Mm -hmm. Those steps of talent, bringing people in, standards, um, sourcing, screening, securing, and orienting, they're going to be the same. I mean, the basic principles don't change. But what goes into those four or five steps will probably change. What about uh, performance management? How do you think the future of performance management is uh, evolving, yeah. uh, regardless of the crisis? That's one. And then in view of the crisis, do you think that we know how it's going to change? Or what are your thoughts on it? Um, I, I, there's two questions there. Uh, in view of the crisis, will things change? And maybe we hold that off. Let me go into yes. performance management. And yes. by the way, what I love about this interview is we float here and then we can dive deep into a topic. So we'll dive deep. Yes. A few years ago, people were saying, get rid of performance management. Get rid of performance management. It's negative. It's biased. It's not helpful. And to be honest, that was the silly idea. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is people need to feel an accountability. And if there's no accountability, change is not likely to happen. The silly example, I'll give two bad examples, one, one, one personal and one, uh, uh, if I rent a car, how likely am I to fill it up with gasoline? I'm not, unless there's an accountability that I have to pay four times for the price of petrol. Well, with that accountability, I will fill it up. Almost nobody washes the rent a car before they return it. I can just imagine if I'm in Bangalore, I rent a car and I go wash it because I say, oh, it got dirty today. I'm going to wash it. No, I'm not. There's no accountability. But I will fill it up with petrol because there is accountability. What we know is that performance appraisal has to be shifted from the focus on appraisal to positive performance accountability. And how does a leader have an interaction with an employee so that there is an accountability? Uh, there's a colleague I know who has two daughters. They're 15 and they're 13. And they're very talented young women. And, and his goal as a father and his wife's goal as a mother is to help them feel some accountability for their studies. But if they say to their daughters, wake up in this pandemic and do whatever you want, there's no accountability today. Those daughters are going to do video games. They're going to call their friends. But those thoughtful parents say, there is some accountability for your education. So from the time you get up until about one or two o'clock, this is a hypothetical, you're going to be accountable to do your studies. We need accountability. 
So how does that happen in performance management? The steps of performance management are the same. What's the strategy? What are we trying to accomplish? What are the metrics? What are the behaviors and outcomes we track? And how do we have consequences if we meet or miss those metrics? Again, in my spirit of simplicity, what are you trying to do? How do you know if you've done it? What happens when you do it? But here's the insight. Those are not the key steps in positive performance accountability. The key step is, can I as a leader have a conversation with my employee about what are you trying to do? How do we know if you've done it? What happens when you do it well or poorly? And now the key is that accountability, is the conversation. And making that conversation work for me is one of the key essences of great leadership. I'll give an example. In this uh, current environment we're in, tragically, some employees have to be let go to manage costs. I, it's tragic. It's very tragic. It may have to happen. I was coaching a business leader recently, and I won't do anything else to name this because it's a fairly private story, who ended up being in a position to have to let an employee, a very talented employee go. The business leader said, what's your hint? My hint was the following. Can that employee who you have to let go leave the interaction with you feeling better about him or herself? By the way, that is a tough test. When I interact as a leader with an employee, do they leave the interaction with me feeling better about themselves? In this case, it was so incredible. I know the leader. I know the employee. I knew the meeting was happening, and the employee who was let go called me as a friend and said, Dave, I'm changing companies, and I've decided with my partner that we're going to move on and do something else, and I feel okay about it. Wow. I sent a note to the leader, and again, the criteria is, can an employee leave an interaction with you as a leader feeling better about themselves? And I said to the leader, congratulations. You've pulled off nearly the impossible. You've helped this employee feel better about themselves, even in a tough discussion. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's the same thing with children. Mm -hmm. uh, let's assume my friend with a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old daughter, once in a rare moment, has to discipline them. The goal of discipline is not punishment. The goal of discipline is love and affection to show those daughters how much you care so that your guidance to them will make them feel better about themselves. That was a long answer, and I apologize for being so verbose. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Uh, it does resonate very well, um, particularly uh, in the context of uh, having conversations where you have to give some constructive feedback and at the same time, the employee needs to walk out with the feeling that it is said with an intent of them becoming better. And it's not an easy conversation it at all. It, it is not. So, so let me ask a question with my hypothetical example. Yes. With the father of these 50, how does the father of these 15 and 13 year old girls do it with their daughters? We know the father loves them. Mm -hmm. And again, this is clearly hypothetical. Yes. Uh, <laughs> how does the father of those sweet girls communicate both discipline and mm -hmm. affection? How, mm -hmm. how would the father do that? I think it is primarily on uh, the fact that showing what is working well uh, nice. Uh, nice. for them. Uh, and second is uh, that uh, you know, particularly when you need to nudge them towards a change in behavior. Um, for example, uh, you know, typical uh, fathers of teenage kids who may have their rooms not being cleaned as expected <laughs> on a regular. Uh, how do you actually give them that constructive feedback? <laughs> to make it a habit. It's a tough thing to do. <laughs> And by the way, for those who are watching, I think I've just discovered the father. <laughs> uh, but let me tell you what I love about what you just said. One, focus on what's right, not what's wrong. Yes. Two, focus on the relationship. Yes. And I'm going to use a word in family that may not translate to business. You love your daughters. You have deep yes. affection. Yes. As, a, as a leader, I care for my employees. Yes. My interest is not to punish. My interest yes. is to help. Yes. To help them reach their goals. 
Right. If you have a goal of being independent as a as an as an employee, yeah. I want to give you the pathway to reach your goal. And yeah. when we help leaders do that, we win. Yeah. I should also add that there's a technology component here, mm -hmm. and you should use people hum to make that happen. I have to say that three times. So anyway, that was my uh, that was my plug for you. Thank um, you. But but I, I really love that discussion about organizations should be places where we navigate this inherent paradox between caring for the individual and attending to the organization's competitiveness. With our daughter, we love our, with my children. Oh, I got a show, I can do this. This is our children um, and grandchildren. A couple of years ago, that's in the middle, that's a very beautiful woman, that's my wife, that's a very ugly father, husband, that's me. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think navigating this inherent paradox is part of parenting. Mm -hmm. you love and you correct. Tough love was the word That's that right. we should. It's the same in organizations today. We are coming out of a, an environmental virus. When people watch this, that will be in the, in the rearview mirror. We have to treat individuals with great affection. We care for them. We nurture them. And we've got to get our organization to be very competitive. If we're competitive, if we treat people well, the people, and we don't compete, there is no organization. Hmm. If we compete, but we don't treat people well, there is no energy in the organization. And we have to be able to manage those paradoxes. Thank you. It's very insightful. Um, shifting gears a, a, a little bit. Um, what's your uh, interpretation of the uh, term future of work? Uh, mean and specifically, how do you think it relates to uh, leadership codes uh, and so on? Would be very interested to hear your perspective on that. You know, I think um, one of my perspectives is a bit tongue in cheek. Everybody wants to write a, a column or an essay on future of work 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, I'm tempted to write one future of work 99.0 because <laughs> uh, we always want to see the future. Um, I think a lot of great stuff has been done about future of work. Here's for me the fundamental premise. The future of work starts not with work, but with the context. Content is king. And, I'll, and I'm, I'm not being sexist here. But what we do is critical to our success. Context, not content, but context is the kingdom. And so the context shapes the future of work. What's changing in our external context? We've identified six domains, social trends, and those happen in religious trends, um, urban trends. The big one is technological trends, digital technology, major changes. Economic trends, cycles of industry, political trends. I think in India, in the United States, in Brazil, in Europe, there are political issues we have to attend to environmental trends, caring for the social responsibility and planet, and demographic trends. Social, technological, economic, demographic, environmental, or political, economic, and I'm going to start over. Social, technological, environmental, uh, political, economic, and demographic trends. Those trends set the context for the future of work. In that context, leaders need to develop a new set of skills in the five areas we talked about. Mm. Strategy. We have to be able to respond quicker, quicker, agilely, learn, execution. We've got to be able to take simple successes and move, and, 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 uh, and move quickly. Talent management. We have to shape what's called today an employee experience. We've got to create that employee experience in a more powerful way. Human capital development. We have to build sustainable organizations. The personal character in the middle doesn't change quite as much. I hope um, we judge ourselves by the content of our character more than by the actions we take. But I think that uh, future of work is about the context in which we operate. And so if I'm in HR and I'm in a meeting and we talk about the future of work, I want to begin to say, what's changing in the context of the world in which we operate? Hmm. For example, in re uh, uh, digital is changing everything. Um, the, the, the technology revolution. We don't have stores as much as we have online. Well, given that we're shifting from retail physical spaces to online distribution, we've got to change how we do our work. Hmm. 
I'm going to do a part B and I'll do it quickly. I'm talking way too much. Um, there's three things that I think HR focuses on in the future of work, talent, leadership, and organization. Mm -hmm. Talent. Given that we're moving in retail from a physical space to an online distribution, do we have the right people with the right skills at the right time? Do we bring them in, the thing we talked about? Do we move them through? Do we occasionally move them out and retain them? Are they committed? Are they having the right experience? Are they fully engaged? Talent matters, but so does organization. In fact, in our research, we found that the organizational culture has four times the impact on business results than talent. If you're an HR professional, I have my five fingers, that's the people. I have my fist, that's the organization. One of the things we have to do is turn individual skills into teams and organizations. And the intersection of talent and organization is leadership. So an HR professional looks at that context social, technical, economic, political, environmental, demographic changes, and says, what are the implications on talent, leadership, and organization that we have to create within the organization, that we have to create in order to be successful? Mm -hmm. I want to uh, drill down a little bit on one of the dimensions of the context, specifically on the technological uh, dimensions. Um, how... Uh, important or critical or technological tools today uh, within organizations in the context of employee experience do you think uh, organizations are using them effectively and what do you think are some of the best practices they need to do in order to improve the employee experience and take it to the next level you know i really love that question um, and again, I'm going to probably respond too long. Number one, I think I get overwhelmed with technology sometimes. There's a lingo out there, big data, biotech, block, blockchain, cloud computing, digitization, drones, gamification, internet of things, machine learning. I just sometimes get overwhelmed with all of the terms. And I know you're an engineer and a scientist, and you probably understand all of those. I get lost. In fact, I'm sometimes seen as out of date. Uh, I, uh, I was with a group of college students recently doing some, some coaching and mentoring, and uh, I said to them, email me if you have a question. Oh, oh, email. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> yeah, we use all of these new apps that I don't even understand. Well, let's send some message. Let's tweet or Twitter. And anyway, I get overwhelmed. So my first point. I think we have to turn technology into a simple message, and here it is for me. All of those new terms in technology have one agenda, to create digital information. That's it. Mm -hmm. What technology does is provide us access to digital information. An analog watch tells time by two hands. A digital watch, I have a digital watch, tells time more precisely. Digital information changes the way we do our work. Now, point two, in the HR space, that digital information dramatically changes how we think about HR. Um, for example, I think sometimes in the HR field, we, we've gone through four phases of digital HR. And what I like about your work and others is you're moving to the fourth phase. One, efficiency. Use technology platforms and digital to more efficiently do HR work. Put, uh, put HR practices online, Oracle, SAP, Workday 2. Innovation in apps. There is so much innovation. Josh Burson, who's the thought leader in this space, said once there are 2,700 new apps in the HR digital space. I think that's where di HR digital is playing. It's efficiency and innovation. I get asked a lot, uh, <laughs> uh, would you endorse this app? And you probably get asked that as well. Mm -hmm. I got asked recently, the app was, we can take a visual of your face mm -hmm. and tell you what leadership style you have. <laughs> And, and I, I, I sent a note back and I said, have you seen my face? Uh, you don't want me as your promoter because I don't have the right face. I have two or three chins. Um, but I think in the space we're in, we've tried to become more efficient. We've tried to be innovative. I think we're now moving to stage three, which is innovate, information. Information. How do we use an app to provide better information? Information is the goldmine. Wayne Brockbank, my colleague, says, we live in the information age. 
I think we're moving now to stage four, which mm. is connection and experience. Mm. So to your comment, I think that we need to use digital applications to build connection and to mm. find ways to connect with each other and to have a positive experience. It's not about, can we put our performance appraisal system online? Can we do it more innovatively? Will it give us information about doing our job better? What can the experience be through a digitally enabled technology? And my sense is that's what you're trying to do in some with people, huh? that the experience is the key. And when we look at that experience, that begins to be, for me, the next step for digital, for digital HR, oh. building experiences through that effort. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, people, um, the main philosophy is to enrich the employee experience uh, on the, by the tools that we are building. Lastly, um, could, could I add one piece to that? Yes, absolutely. And it's my passion. Yes. What makes a good employee experience? I have found that the best employee experiences come when the employee experience connects to the customer experience. Hmm. Because when what we do as an employee creates value for a customer, we create a virtuous cycle. And here's an example. Again, people may be watching this after the coronavirus is over. We're in the middle of it. Um, almost everybody is sheltered around the world. We're working from home. Uh, welcome again to my office. And, and the focus in HR was on those early phases. Can you find a computer? Can you find a quiet space? Can you dress for work? That's not the issue of working at home. The issue from working at home, when you get to the experience stage, is how does my work from home create value for the customers my company is serving? Mm -hmm. And if I can begin to think as an HR person or business person, it's not about the technology. It's about how the technology enables an experience mm. that gives the employee a better experience. If at the end of the day, I say, my work today at home, on an airplane, in a hotel, wherever work is done, has helped a customer be more successful, mm. then I can have, that is the experience that, that, that is meaningful to me. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, Lastly, um, any other important sound bites that uh, you would like to leave our audience with? Uh, you know, I know you do a lot of work on talent and people and what's next in that space. Um, well, I'm going to ask you before I give my conclu my, some of mine. Sure. Um, you've been in this business a long time. You've done great work with People Hub and HR technology. Where do you see that space going in the future? I've laid out my, you know, from efficiency to innovation, to information to connection and experience. Where do you see that space going? Interesting, actually. Um, uh, it very much resonates with the main thing that you uh, were saying uh, earlier, uh, which is what we see in People Home, which is how do you marry the employee experience to the customer experience? Yeah. And that's exactly what we have been uh, trying to achieve with uh, people harm. Um, it's not just about uh, the retention and engagement anymore. It's about the fact that the employees are having a phenomenal experience that translates to good customer experience, which obviously translates to a successful business. And that's the key trend that we are seeing. And that's, it. that's what our customers have been asking very simple things right it's it, it, it's about how do you actually marry okrs to an employee's engagement and those types of things uh these are the types of things that we are uh, hearing from our customers throughout the world and uh, that is really what uh, is resonating for us and as we build our product out we are really not just looking at it as just automating another hr business process it's more about how does the experience translate to better customer experience and for good growth of the business? You know, I, uh, uh, we should high five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, at, uh, if you look at that employee customer experience, the original work on that was done in a doctoral dissertation by a colleague named David Bowen, worked with Ben Schneider, and they showed in banks mm. that when you have more engaged employees, however you major engagement, you will get more engaged customers. And it's almost obvious. Um, I was lucky enough to be around some of that research a number of years ago. I think we're seeing that, that follow through, that 
the way that an employee feels treated should be correlated with the way a customer feels treated. Hmm. I work at a company called the RBL Group. I'm a professor in Michigan, but we do consulting. We call that taking an outside-in point of view. For example, um, I love to ask people the question, what's the best thing HR can give an employee? It's a great question. And often the answers are around a sense of belief, and this is kind of the, the trends in talent, meaning, purpose, why am I here? A sense of become, am I learning, am I growing, am I getting better through appraisals, through training, and a sense of belonging, believe, become, and belong. Do I have a community? Do I have a team? And everybody lists that. In fact, I did a webinar yesterday. I did a polling test a couple of days ago. What's the best thing HR can give an employee? A, believe. B, become. C, belong. D, all of the above. 79% mm. checked all of the above. Mm -hmm. E, none of the above. <laughs> we had over 1,000 people on the webinar. 2% checked E, none of the above. Mm. My answer is it's E. Mm. What's the best thing HR can give an employee? And my answer is an organization that wins in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. The best thing we can give an employee is an organization that wins in the marketplace. If we don't win in the marketplace, there is no workplace. There's no belief, become, or belong. You got to win. That applies to talent. It applies to culture. Um, at RBL, we had a lot of companies come and say, help us with our culture. Where's your culture? Here's our value statements and their behaviors that flow. No. Culture is the identity of the firm in the mind of the marketplace. Excellent. You start culture from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Will those values create value for your customer? Leadership. What makes an effective leader? Here's the competencies, those five things we talked about. Not enough. Are you connecting leadership to your external brand mm -hmm. outside in? And so all of the work we've started to do is to filter through that criteria of winning in the marketplace. Having said all that, I hope OKRs start with the first letter, which is C, customer. Mm. Customer OKR. Mm. Because if the OKRs we have aren't creating value for our customer, mm. then why are we doing them? Yes. That's like working at home. I frankly don't care where you work. Yes. You can work at home. You can work on an airplane. You can work in an office. You can work in a, in a, in a bus on the way to work. Does, where is not critical? Mm -hmm. What you do at work to create value for your customer is critical. Excellent. I believe, and you said any headlines, one of the takeaways for me of this uh, pandemic period is that we're going to redefine the boundaries of a company. For generations, we've had in our head, I go to work, I'm at work, and I return home from work. And work is a place. I think the boundaries of work will increasingly be values. Mm. I'm at work when I am doing something that creates value for my customer. Mm. Where I do that can be in a lot of different places. It may be at a gym when I'm exercising. It may be, it may be in my office where I'm, where I'm pondering. It may be on, online when I'm writing. Mm. I think that boundary of work is not physical, but a set of values. Mm. And I hope as HR people, we can begin to make that set of values a fundamental principle. Uh, the other thing I see, and then I'll shut up, in this new world, um, we don't have children at home. As I said, here's the, uh, oh, I'll show another picture. These are our children who have children. I, uh, I don't always do this. This is my uh, mother. Oh, okay. And, uh, oh, my uh, okay. sister and I. Uh -huh. um, so you've now met my family. Uh -huh. We are all being affected differently by this uh, pandemic. Hmm. Our children who have children at home who are young, having to do homeschooling, having to do discipline, they don't have a 13 and 15 year old daughter with great discipline. They're having to train their children, our grandchildren. <laughs> They're struggling. Mm. Dad, this is hard. <laughs> My wife and I are in a different age group where we live in a nice house, we have resources. It's a wonderful, it's not wonderful, but it's different. My mother, who's now 92, is scared. She does, she's worried because the, the, the age has more, more fear for her. The takeaway, I think, out of this pandemic for me is we as business leaders and HR leaders need to customize and personalize. Mm. Work is going to be a very different thing for every person. Mm. Can we build a tailored experience, go back to your experience that you do, 
for that employee. And, and I think that's going to be a fascinating challenge as we go forward. Wow. I have one last comment, and I'll make it, and then I'll turn it back to you. I, I, again, thank you, thank you. It's six words, <laughs> and it's my fundamental optimism and belief. The best is yet ahead. The cool. best is yet ahead. I, I believe that. That's my commitment to learning. That's my organizational compulsive disorder. I don't, I'm not compulsive to punish people. Mm. I'm compulsive to learn and to teach and to grow. The best is yet ahead. And I strongly believe that in the HR field. Wonderful, Dave. Uh, it's really, really nice to hear such optimistic note uh, during such trying times. Uh, I'm sure the best is yet to come. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you, Dave. Uh, I really appreciate your time and sharing your views with us. It's been an enriching learning experience uh, for me personally and will, uh, and will surely be for our viewers too. Let's keep in touch and have a safe and healthy time ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sukar.